Ruxana Khan is an award-winning author and storyteller who holds audiences of all ages spellbound with tales from the Middle East and from her own life. She's the author of numerous books for children, including The Roses in My Carpets, which won the Janusz Korczak Award. Khan was born in Lahore, Pakistan, and immigrated to Canada with her family at the ripe age of three. Highly acclaimed, just last week, she was attending a storytelling festival in the Yukon. Let's welcome her to Words Aloud Festival. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I thought since our lovely MC um, introduced my book that I'm going to read it to you. It's very short and it's a children's book. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Yanis Korczak, the man the award was named after. You see, he was a Jewish children's writer from World War II. And he used to write these books that were really popular in Europe. And what happened to him was when the Nazis invaded Poland, they rounded up all the Jewish people and they were sending them to concentration camps. But when they found out that this guy was Janusz Korczak, they said, oh, we can't send you there. We love your books. That's the power of story. Now, but the thing is, he had a lot of children with him. They were orphans. So he said to the Nazis, he said, well, what's going to happen to the children in my orphanage? Can I take them with me? And the Nazis said, no, those children, they must go to the concentration camp. And he said, you know, I can't leave them. So he went with those children to a place called Treblinka, and that's where all of them were killed. Now, he was such a hero that the Polish Ministry of Culture, they named this award in his honor, and every two years, they'd give the Janusz Korczak Award to six books in the world with humanitarian themes. Mine was one of them. Thank you. Now, I was really honored to receive this award, but I also thought it was kind of funny, because here I am, a Muslim woman, and I won an award named after a Jewish guy. Okay, if you think about that, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Okay. Now, <laughs> I'm going to read you the story. I just want to let you know one thing about it. Uh, it took me four years to write, so don't think that a children's book is easy to write. It's not necessarily so. The Roses in My Carpets. It's always the same. Jets scream overhead, tearing the fabric of the sky. They've seen me. I'm running too slowly, dragging my mother and sister behind. The ground is treacherous, pitted with bomb craters. My mother and sister weigh me down. They hold me back. A direct hit. Just as I'm about to die, or sometimes just after, I wake up. Blessed darkness. A moment passes before I realize where I am in our mud house, in the refugee camp, safe. I hear the quiet breathing of my mother and sister nearby. Then, the, then a cock crows, and the eerie cry of the muezzin calls me to prayer. It's dawn. I might as well rise and fetch water from the well before there's a lineup. My breath floats in clouds before me as I return with the heavy bucket. The plastic handle cuts into my hand. I must stop and rest several times on the way home. At home, I wash my face. A useless habit. Here the walls are mud, the floor is mud, and the courtyard is mud too. It's impossible to stay clean. I wake my mother before I go to the mosque for prayer. When I get back, she has breakfast ready. My little sister Maha still sleeps, so I get to eat my bit of bread and sip my tea in peace. Then I kiss Maha's sleeping face and go off to school. I hate school. It's a room full of restless boys. The girls are in another class. We sit on rough mats that rub my ankles raw. I'd rather be weaving carpets. When I come home for lunch, the hut is swept and tidy. I eat slowly, breaking my bread into little pieces to make it last longer. Maha wolfs down her share, then she looks at mine. 
No, says my mother sternly. But when her back is turned, I give Maha a few bites of my bread. I will pull my sash a little tighter. Again, the muazzin calls me to prayer. Forgetting to be careful, I step into the narrow street. A car brushes past, blasting a warning. In this place, they drive like they're crazy. I'm just glad that Maha is at home, safe. After Zuhar prayer comes my favorite time of day. It's a time when I get to practice my skill as a carpet weaver. When I am weaving, I can escape the jets, the nightmares, everything. It's as if with my fingers I create a world the war cannot touch, a little piece of paradise like the one where my father is. My father was a farmer at the mercy of the weather or anyone who would steal his land or crops. But I will have a skill that no one can take away. And as long as I am strong and able, my family will never go hungry. But first, I must practice. I am a sponsored child, a foster child. They even took my picture. But one day soon, I will be a master craftsman, and my sponsor's money will not be needed. Then I will hold my head high for the sake of my father, who died while plowing our field in the war. He would never have taken aid from a sponsor. Each color that I weave has a special meaning for me. The threads which line the frame, upon which all the other threads are knotted, are white. White for the shroud we wrapped my father's body in. Black is for the night. It cloaks us from enemy eyes. Green is the color of life. Blue is the sky. One day, it will be free of jets. Everything in camp is a dirty brown, so I do not use brown in my carpets. Red is my favorite. Red is the color of the blood of martyrs. But it's also the color of roses. I have never grown flowers. Every bit of land must yield food, so I make sure there are plenty of roses in my carpets. I weave intricate patterns of roses, each connected to the other, like the tribes of Afghanistan. It's a garden of beauty, surrounded by a border, a wall, a wall around a little piece of paradise. I am so intent on my weaving that at first, I do not hear the gasping breath of the boy who has entered the room. It's the silence that alerts me. I look up. Everyone is staring at me. Something is terribly wrong. It's your sister. She's been hit by a truck. I jump to my feet and spill a thousand threads on the floor. A friend says to leave them, he'll pick them up. I nod and run out the door. The runner tells me Maha's at the clinic. My mother is with her. They are operating, trying to save her legs. When I arrive, my mother is frantic, trying to reach Maha. People are holding her back. There is screaming. It's coming from me. My mother turns, her eyes wild, like when my father died. I must be strong. I must not cry. Gently, I take her aside and tell her she's in the way. She nods, and my words sink in. Then she puts her head on my shoulder, and I see that I've grown. A strange time to notice such things. I tell my mother to go home, pray for Maha's safety. When there is news, I will come. I cannot just sit and wait. I pace. Then I take my own advice and I pray. I pray for Maha and for my mother. Then I pray for my sponsor who is paying for Maha's operation but doesn't know it. Afterward, I feel better. Finally, the doctor emerges looking really tired. Good news. Maha will be all right. Her legs are broken, but she will be able to walk again. Not soon but one day. Relief washes over me like a cool rain. I run home to tell my mother. She looks old. She weeps for joy. We have bread and water for supper that night. Mother rips the bread into three pieces before she realizes there's only two of us. She gives me Maha's share. I give half of it back. In silence, we eat. Every bite sticks in my throat. No amount of water helps. Exhausted, I lie down on the straw mat that is my bed. It's too quiet without Maha. 
I miss her terribly. For a long time, I cannot sleep. When I finally do, I dream again of the jets, tearing the fabric of the sky. But this time, my mother and sister do not drag at me. They run with me and do not hold me back. And while running, we find a space the size of a carpet where the bombs cannot touch us. Within that space, there are roses. The end. <laughs>